And then eventually Numbers 13. 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, after I got this uh, message all written up down in Panama, Brent uh, and Jen took us to a, a family that uh, they had known and is a very poor house, very poor, where you can have rich and middle class and poor all side by side. And it was just a two blocked, uh, it was a block building with two rooms, tin roof, and uh, they had a couch in the open area. And when I sat down, I felt like all these creepy crawlies were crawling on me. And it was just very poor, no running water, uh, nothing like that. Uh, and while we're standing there, the Oh, uh, the fellow's brother was standing there, and he, and he goes, uh, Caleb! And I said, Caleb? That sounds like Caleb. And that's how they pronounce Caleb. And that's what the message is about. And it's like the Lord said, I just wanted to confirm to you that's what I want you to do, way down in Panama. I want to confirm that. So if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll go ahead and pray before we read this. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. And help us to take these Old Testament stories and get some comfort out of them. Because uh, comfort and learning, and it gives us some patience and help us to see uh, and understand these ideas. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapter 10, verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Okay, so there are seven topics where he, he writes that about. Six by Paul, one by Peter. And this is, uh, don't be ignorant of the Old Testament stories. Okay, don't be ignorant of the Old Testament stories. Several years ago down in Jasper County, I was talking to these guys, they were behind the bars, and, and I mentioned David and Goliath, I said, you guys ever heard that story? And here, raised in America, they never heard that story. And the one kid said, oh yeah, wasn't Goliath that dog? I said, What? I guess there's a cartoon, David and Goliath. But in America, they didn't know the story of David and Goliath. Okay, but uh, we are not to be ignorant of these stories. Uh, Goliath, David and Goliath is an example of don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Because David had the gun and Goliath had the knife and he lost. Okay, here's the stories that he's wanting us to specifically look at. He says, How that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So that's the Red Sea crossing. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, so that's the manna. And did all drink of the same spiritual drink, which they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That's the water coming out of a rock. And with many of them, God was not... Pleased, well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So they did some things that upset God. So if we read the story, find out what they did that uh, that uh, did not please God, do the opposite, then possibly we'll please God. He says, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then you got verse 7, 8, 9, 10, all starting with neither. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So that's Exodus 32, that's, that's with Aaron and the golden calf. That's when Sandy Patty, Amy Grant, and Striper, and Petra, and all those guys showed up, and they sang. Okay, and then it says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Okay, that's Numbers 25. That's with Balaam. And this is a grave, grave, oh, just horrible contradiction in the King James Bible. Because here it says 23,000, and Numbers 25 it says 24,000. You say, well, that is a contradiction. Now if you read the words in verse 8. Fell in one day, 3 and 20,000. So it's obvious one day they had 23,000 deaths. And then within the few days follow, another 1,000 died. In Numbers it said 24,000 died in a plague. In First Corinthians it said 23,000 died in one day. How do they overlook that? How do they miss that? That's very easy. Okay, verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That's Numbers 21. 
That's when he brought out the uh, brass pole and a brass serpent, and that's the symbol for the healing arts to this day. And then, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Okay, that's Numbers 13 and 14. That's what I want to look at this morning. And then he says in verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. Now that is different, slightly different than the word example. Okay, and in sample is a small sample of the larger. And they were written for our, notice, for our doctrine. No, it's for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. So if you would, let's go back to Numbers 13 and look at Caleb. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of the way we pronounce these words, like Habakkuk, we say Habakkuk, it's probably Habakkuk. Uh, when you go to Israel, you gotta have, you gotta make sure you get a cold in your throat and talk with hawkers all the time, you know, cause that's how it sounds. You know, Habakkuk. <laughs> okay, but. <laughs> Oh, the way we pronounce them, I'm sure it's wrong, but uh, we'll find figure that out when we get to heaven. So uh, this is a story that often is sung in um, in kids' Sunday school class. You know, twelve men went to spy out Canaan; ten were bad, two were good, and then you sing that for the kids. Okay, that's the storyline. But I want to show you something in chapter 13 and 14. So we're going to run down through this, skim read a little bit of it. And it says in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 1, as you read down through there, 12 men followed the instructions of God. All 12 followed God's instructions to believe the promise. There was a promise in the middle of these instructions. To believe the promise, 12, all 12 followed the instructions to believe the promise. Okay, and then ten were not allowed to go into the land of Canaan because they did not believe the promises of God, or the promise, singular here, and two men go in. Chapter 13, 1, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. Okay, so that's the instructions. A lot of Christians follow the instructions of the Bible, practical, spiritual, devotional instructions. And that's good to do. We get the benefit out of that. There are some doctrinal beliefs that doesn't match their circumstance of life, and they discredit those. Okay? And they'll pick and choose these things we go along with. This, I just, I can't imagine how that would happen. So in that verse, if you look at the verse... Send thou men, so that was an order by God to Moses. You send these men, and then it says that they may search the land of Canaan. Now, starting in verse 4, down to 15, are the fellows that went. They followed the instructions. Like in 2 Timothy, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Most... Uh, men, be they good, be they bad, will look at the Bible from an instructional viewpoint because that's where we get the benefits. The doctrine is often overlooked, ignored, sidestepped, just put in a back burner, sometimes downright ridiculed, the doctrine. Okay, so, yeah, they're all, they're saved people, evangelicals, fundamentalists, what do you want to call them? The instructions are the same, and they will, I would follow many of the same instructions. If we sat down and lived some basic li- things of life, we would discover, hey man, we're hitting about 90%. But this doctrinal thing, that's a different ballgame. Caleb is a good illustration of a Bible believer who wholly follows the Lord. Now, in that verse, okay, send thou men, and then he says that they may search the land of Canaan, and then this statement, which I give unto the children of Israel. That's just, that's just a promise. That's a promise. Okay, that's like doctrine there. I give unto the children of Israel. And then he says, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man. Okay, they follow that to a T. 
Everyone a ruler among them. And they followed that to the T. Okay, now if you pick up in verse 4, you'll see the name of one of the fellows, Shamua. He was a whale. Shamu the whale. Okay, and then Shaphat. Shaphat. And then there's Caleb, or Caleb, we would say. Okay, so there's one of the good guys. And then there's Igal, verse 7. And then, then there's Hosea, or Hosea. That's another way of spelling Joshua. Sometimes H is in front of it. Uh, most of the time the Bible will spell it Joshua. It's like John, Jonathan, Johnny, John Boyd. John Boyd would be out down Tennessee. Okay, and so that's how that works. Okay, and so there's no contradiction. It's a different spelling of a word. That's all that it is. Hosea. And then in verse 9, uh, Palti. Verse 10, gad Verse 11, Gaddy. Verse 12, Emil. Verse 13, Sether, 14, Nabi, uh, 15, Ghoul, what a name, Ghoul. Okay, you got that name. Now, does anybody know any boys by the name of Ghoul, or Shamu, or Shamu, or Shaphath, or Egel, or Palti? Does anybody know a young man named Caleb or Joshua? We all could say that, right? Why why that happen? Why is that like that? It's because in Proverbs it says in 10 verse 7, it says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Parents, when they we name our children, in America you don't see Americans naming their boys Benedict. Why Benedict Arnold? That's our culture. You can go to Rome, they'll name them Benedict but not in our culture. Why? Because as parents, we want to give our children what we think is a good name from a good person, good character. But of those 12 men, we only hear of two of the names. And a person might say, yeah, but those other names are really weird. Caleb is, you know, that if to pronounce it like that sounds kind of different. We say Caleb. We say Joshua. Okay, Joshua, you only find that name in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, when Joshua is uh, referenced two times, in the New Testament, it's spelled J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. It's the same word. It's just different spelling. The new Bibles that put Joshua in the New Testament are not being honest. Okay, but here we have the men. Now, these, uh, these 12 men are not bad men. They obeyed what God said to do. They just didn't believe what God said to believe. That's all that they did. That's the only thing they did wrong. And that belief or lack of belief caused a problem. Okay, then in, they go through the city, they go through the land, okay, and they, in verse 17 down to 25, Okay, there's kind of the context of the area. They go into the land. They go up and down. They look at the land. They look at the people. They look at the city. And the time period was the time of the first ripe grapes. It's the time of the vineyard. So they they took a cluster of grapes and they put it on a little scale, put it in a little plastic bag, and then they brought it back. No, they took a singular cluster of grapes and put it over a rod, and then two men had to carry it. Good-sized grapes. You're not going to see that in any of the stores these days. That was a very prosperous land. And then they get back and they show that. Okay, so now they got, in verse 26, they've got the whole congregation there. Okay, again, the Bible wants us not just to read it, but meditate on it. Okay, so if you can imagine this, Moses and Aaron, how many people are we talking? Well, we know the exact number for all the soldiers. All the men from 20 years old and upward who were able to go to war was 603,550 men. So you take that number of soldiers, over 600,000 soldiers, then you figure out their grandparents, you figure out the wives and mothers, you figure out their siblings. So conservatively speaking, we're going to have to put it around 2 to 3 million, probably 3 million or more. 
So you got three million people. Somehow Moses and Aaron are on this rock ledge so that their voice can boom out. I kind of doubt they had speaker system, but maybe they had something figured out. And so it booms out there. And so here comes the 12 men that's going to report. And the 10 evidently got the first shot at it. So in verse 26, and they came, uh, and they, w- they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, to all the congregation of children of Israel, under the wilderness of Paran. Okay, so Paran is the location where they're at. If you get a map in the back of your Bible, see where it's at. And I, I put that in there, and I showed the path, and I showed that they do a U-turn there, back into Saudi Arabia. Okay, so it says, brought back word. They're in Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, showed them the fruit of the land. So there's that big cluster of grapes. And they told him, and said, we came into the land, whither thou sent us. Okay, we did what God told us to do. God told us to do it, and surely it flows with milk and honey, common saying, it's prosperous, and this is the fruit. So they did what God said to do. They followed his instructions. But when they saw the land and the circumstances, they're thinking in their mind, hey, there's no way we're going to conquer this land. Okay, these people are people that witnessed ten plagues in Egypt. They witnessed the death of the firstborn in Egypt. They witnessed the crossing of the Red Sea where a cold frost wind came through and blew the waters, the wall, the waters up to where it says the Bible congealed. That's like it came, same solid ice. They walk through and they see there's a natural land bridge. Amazing. And they had to move some of the rocks in the bottom of the ocean or the water, put it aside, and put them aside, and then they're coming through. And, and then they get to the other side, and on the other side, these same people saw water come out of a rock. These same people experienced eating manna every single day. And then on Friday, they had three times the amount or twice the amount, so they can get through the Sabbath and then Sunday. These people saw the pillar of fire leading them, the pillar of cloud. They saw Mount Sinai being fire burning at the top when God spoke to them. They heard God's voice, and they got so scared, they said to Moses, you go talk to him. Man, we're scared of hearing that. And the Lord said, that's smart. Why don't you have Moses come talk to me? Moses goes up there, and he sees God, uh, you know, they say face to face, but the Lord only showed him the back part of him. As far as you can see, he came back down. His face was so shiny. They saw this kind of glory on his face, and he had to cover himself because it was so shocking. These people saw all that, and they don't think God can beat some guys who are about 10 foot tall and take down the walls. You see, a person forgets those things. A person has a bad memory and they forget. Joshua and Caleb remembered those things and remembered, our God's bigger than them giants. Because that's what they were looking at. Verse eight, 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Who is that? Verse 33. And there, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. You know, they were not like Kung Fu grasshopper. You can take them down, grasshopper. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, if you're a grasshopper, take them down. Okay, and so these guys looked at the obstacles. Caleb and Joshua looked at the opportunity. Our God's bigger than that. Okay, we go back up to 29. You can see the Amalekites and who's there. And then in verse 30, it says, Caleb stilled the people before Moses. When he writes like that, that is implying these people are talking in the crowd, the audience. Two to three million. They're griping. They're pouting. They're crying. You know, I'm going to go eat worms. You know, all that stuff. I mean, they're all doing this stuff. And he had to steal them. A true Bible believer, once in a while, when you get around some Christians that obey instructions of the Bible, don't believe the doctrines, you know, you got to settle them down sometime. Relax. You're missing out a great blessing to believe the words. You say, yeah, but those things, I just can't accept them. Well, if you can't accept them, fine and dandy. Just believe them. God's bigger than you are. 
Well, I don't understand it. If you understand everything of the Bible, that means you're as smart as God is. A lot of things in this Bible I don't understand. Okay, and these were the giants. You see, you take this back to Genesis chapter 6 where fallen angels take on flesh. That's a strange doctrine. And then they can have a breeding program and produce these giants. I mean, you do it in agriculture all the time. Yeah, they do it with people. In the 1880s, they discovered liquid nitrogen where you can take the egg and the sperm and freeze it for centuries. There was a young couple that had their egg and their sperm frozen in liquid nitrogen. They both got killed or died somehow, and their parents, their grandparents, took that and put it together four years later and had a baby. Of course there's breeding programs. Of course these giants take place. But God's bigger than those giants. You know, some of these nursery rhymes, you ever look at the nursery rhymes, what you actually say to kids? Jack and the Beanstalk. Do you remember that poem? Jack, fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he live, be he dead. I'm going to crush his bones and eat his in my bread. What? That's what these giants do. Satan is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may. We're talking about eating. Behind the scenes, do they do this in public? Of course not. Who would vote for that? But they saw these things. Caleb had to still them, had to settle them down. He, he settled them down and he only got one statement in. He says, but, but in verse 30, he said, Let us go up and watch to possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. That's all he got in. And boom, all the crying and pouting came back in. They brought up an evil report. Uh, verse 30, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Well, of course they're stronger than you. They're bigger than you, but they're not stronger than God. You see, and that's, that's the problem that a lot of times goes on in the Christian world where they've been used to preachers giving them instructions in the Bible they can believe the instructions that will help me out of my life but some of them doctrines man I just can't get into that stuff I don't understand that that's just out there I just don't want to accept that well you you don't know the blessings you're missing out on you just don't know the blessings just believe God I mean we're obeying the same instructions in many ways it's just that I agree with God a little bit more on some of these things so in verse 30, you got the giants. 33, I'm sorry. Okay, then chapter 14. Okay, so after they're done, they go home, and all night long, they're crying in their beer. Pouting, crying, going to bed. <laughs> so chapter 14, verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And I'll bet you Caleb is in his tent saying, Man, this is going to be fun. I mean, you, come on, fellas, you just hit him at the ankles and he's going down. That's all you got to do. Take his knees out. You know they got bad knees, man. They're so big. They got bad knees. Just kick him in the knee. Come on the side of the kneecap like that, and it's going in, and you got him down. And besides that, let's just take guns instead of knives. Let's use these slings. I mean, that's a better target. Uh, Caleb was planning a big deal. 14-2, but everybody else, and the children of Israel murmured, against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, and would God we had died in the wilderness. And Moses, a thought might have said, Yeah, I kind of wish you would have too. But no, didn't come out that way. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? Don't you remember what happened in Egypt? You were slaves. Don't you remember that Pharaoh ordered the death of your kid, all your boys? Don't you remember that? Don't you remember the taxation that you were under there? Don't, how'd you forget all that stuff? Don't you remember you had, what is it, what would it be? N, not double A, J, P. National Advance of the Advancement of Jewish People. <laughs> Don't you remember you went to all those clubs? N, double A, J, P. <laughs> I mean, I mean, can you imagine how they forgot all that? Yeah, they forgot all that. 
Okay, and verse 4, And they said one to another, Let us make us a captain, let us return in Egypt. And if they would have caught Moses at the right time and said, I'll vote for him. Get out of here. <laughs> but it seems like whenever Moses was on the wrong side, God was on the right side. Whenever God wanted to wipe out, Moses said, Nah, don't do it. In this case, Moses was uh, more compassionate. He wanted to kind of give him a chance. So verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. So Moses says, don't do it, folks. He said, don't do it. Please, don't do it. We Come on, we, we, we do a lot of the same things in a Christian life. Come on, just believe this. Just believe this. I know it's out there. I know it seems strange to you. Just believe what God says. Look at the opportunity that's in front of us. Well, verse 6, so they evidently have another meeting. Joshua, the son of Nun, Caleb, and then his dad, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. So they're tearing their clothes off, being very demonstrative, trying to get their attention, because you're talking to thousands of people. And then they said this, uh, saying, The land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. Caleb said, It was so good, I wrote the lyrics, and somebody changed it to America the Beautiful. Several years later, I wrote Israel the Beautiful. Stinking guys are always taking the copyrights away. I mean, he saw the land. It was so beautiful. And then he said, If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not Ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread. They are what? They are bread. That's a common saying that we say. Man, they're, they're toast. They're toast. We're going to burn them. See, they're bread to us. That's where that common saying came from. He said, for their defense is departed from them. Their defense. What is that? The Lord will send his spirit and, and ruin their morale. Their spirit will be afraid. This is what he did with Jericho. When the children of Israel came over the Jordan River, the people in Jericho, the spirit of them just dropped and fell. When you got discouraged people, it's easy to conquer them. And that's a spirit the Lord will send in to cause their fear. I've witnessed this, okay, with some years ago down at uh, Rensselaer uh, at Jasper County uh, County Fair. You can go through it in about 10 minutes. I mean, it's just as puny as could be. But a couple of years, we put a booth in there. We bought a little section. I had a little table, and I put a little booth there. And I put a New World Translation out there and a New International Version side by side. Had them opened up, and I had a little question. Why are they the same? And... I, you know, I've been, I was been in that town up to 20 years at that time. Those people in that, those Christians in town, they're like three or four churches in outside, evangelical fundamentalists. Their, their one point of agreement is stay away from Hoffman. That's the point of agreement. That's their major doctrine. And I'd see these people coming through this tent. It's a huge tent. And I'd, ca- oh, there's so and so. I know so and so. And he goes, in. oh, so and so. And I, then I just kind of watch them. And then they look down and then they see, and as soon as they'd come down to write, my, they'd be looking over here like this. And somehow they never saw me. And it's like I could have waved them, hi, how you doing? You know, and just like that. There's a fear, in, instinctive fear that they don't want to talk to that guy. Might bring them under conviction. Now, a few of them would come by, st- oh, oh, and they didn't see me down, they didn't look down, and they'd say, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm fine, 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 you know, and all that stuff. And then they'd look at, and I have these two Bibles sitting there, fake Bibles, and here's the reaction I would watch. It'd be like, like I put anthrax on the Bibles or something. And then they'd go, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, they take the same 16 verses out. Wow. One of the guys that came and saw that, he said, oh. He said, uh, what do you think of the New King James? I said, well, I think it's a good counterfeit. Eyebrows went up. He said, well, that's the one I preach from. I said, oh, you're a preacher? He said, yeah, I'm a preacher. And I said, where do you preach? He said, in Damat. I said, what church? Well, the Dutch Corner Church, they had the contemporaries and the traditionalists, the ones that wanted to stay with the traditional good Christian music, and the contemporaries, and he said, I'm the pastor of the ones that 
were the traditional ones. <laughs> Contemporary ones kept the building. And that's where that big church is down there in Wheatfield. And I think he was looking for some fellowship, and I was more than welcome to give him some fellowship. And so we yeah, chatted about a few things, and he said, okay, I can see where you're coming from in that. And then he said something like, he said, well, what's your viewpoint on Calvinism? Oh, man. Demont? Come on. <laughs> I said, I was, raised, I was in a Dutch corner church until I was 11 or 12, and then we started Community Bible Church. And I just said, oh, I'm sorry, I... I really don't have a choice in the matter. I was predestinated not to be a Calvinist. And it was like, <laughs> the circuit breakers kind of went off. <laughs> and, oh, I think I better go. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> I said, boy, that was a short, abrupt conversation. But that's that spirit. There's a spirit that doesn't want to be around because they've heard so much that they're afraid of the rumors rather than, we're dealing with a book. The children of Israel, God had already put the fear in the heart of all those people. Here come them Israelites. We heard about them. And all they had to do was mop it up. There was really no problem there at all. Okay, if you keep reading down, you'll see in verse 11, God, uh, in verse 9, their defense is apart, and then they said, The Lord is with us, fear them not. And then look what the congregation wanted to do. Murder them. Well, isn't that kind of common? The ones that obey the instructions don't want to believe the doctrines, want to murder the one that believes the doctrines and not the instructions. or And does the same instructions. And then God got involved, verse 10, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle. God said, I approve of what these guys just said. There comes a pillar of fire. You talk about a visual proof. And they ignored that. And so God had reached his limit, verse 11. God said, I'm done. They're going to call me liars. I'm done. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I showed among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. That's an unusual term. Disinherit. That's often what the Lord's going to do to a born-again believer who just doesn't want to believe all his words. Not going to take their salvation. Thank God for that, right? but they're going to forfeit an inheritance. That they had an opportunity. And he said, I'll make of thee a great nation mightier than they. And then Moses, as a prayer individual who prays, an individual who knew how to get a hold of God, verse 13, 14, 15, look at his praying, and he appeals to God, and he says, God, please pardon him. Please, please, have mercy, pardon him. One man's prayers saved the life of over two million people. Wow, that's some praying. That's some praying. And then verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned them. Okay, I, presidential pardon. Mine's better than theirs. I've pardoned them. But, verse 21, he said, but there's some consequences. But as truly as I live... When God does that, that's an oath that will not change. It's not going to change no matter what man does. He is not going to change that oath. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. I am looking forward to that day. That's what we call the millennium. Hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And then he says, because of those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me now these ten times. So ten times, ten guys. So each guy probably threw his testimony in there. And if I hearken to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it but my servant Caleb. Because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him, Will I bring into the land, wherefore he went, and his seed shall possess it. So, he, he and Joshua, the only two. Okay, then, as you keep reading, 26, 27, 28, 29, <clears throat> the, Lord, the Lord said, okay, I've pardoned him, but, 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 all the guys who are 20 years and up, 
who have complied with these guys' uh, ideas, who have come along with them, he said, those guys aren't going in. So he says to Moses, he says, okay, make a U-turn. Okay, in verse 25, he said, tomorrow, turn you. And Moses says, Lord, we're so far down this interstate, they got no U-turn sign right there. We can't do it. And he said, forget the sign, U-turn. That's a parent. And that's where I put in the back of the Bible and the maps. You'll see they'll make a U-turn and go right back into Saudi Arabia and wander around for 40 years. And that entire time, Caleb was planning, boy, okay, I can do this, I can do that, I'm getting ready to do that. Can you imagine Caleb? He was promised to stay alive. He can get involved in anything. He said, man, I don't care. You can pretend to shoot at me. It don't matter to me. I'm, I'm a, I got God's promises. He told me I'm going to live. Go to the doctor. Doctor said, oh, you got six months to live, Caleb. Oh, get out of here. You got, man, I got another 40 years. I mean, he had God's promises. He believed what God said. He wholly followed the Lord. You keep reading down through there, and you can see that's exactly what happened. Now, if you go to Joshua 14, 45 years later, because you got a couple, you got a few years in there when you go and conquer the land, and you go with a date with Josh, what Caleb said. God took an oath. He swore a blessing to Joshua and Caleb. He swore an, a cursing to the others, and the others disinherited. Here's what Caleb said. Joshua 14, 6. He said, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, okay, there he is, Caleb, his dad, his country, or his tribe, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God. Concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. And I'm sure Joshua nodded and said, yeah, I remember, I remember. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren. Now, I like that person. I like that. Because Caleb didn't say, them lost heathen and died and went to hell. No, there is his brethren. They were Israelites. A lot of folks that don't, don't, aren't Bible believers, they're still saved. They're still good people. They still love the Lord. Okay, a lot of them are that way. Yeah, I know a lot of them are rebelling against God. That's, that's on their heart. That's on them. But a lot of them are just as, they're just as saved and secured in Christ as I am. And we ought to recognize that. And still try to be blessings to these folks and not treat them cruelly. I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us to do that. We, two wrongs don't make a right. Try to be a blessing to them in somehow, some way. He says, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. I wholly followed. And you know, the Lord said the same thing. He said he wholly followed me. Entirely believed what I said. And then he said this, Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said. He said it. I believe it. These forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and come in. Now, is he speaking the truth, or is he an old man that's deceiving himself? I think he's speaking the truth, because Moses, 120, it says his eyes were not dim. Okay, he's just as strong at 85. The Lord kept him strong, and he is ready to go. He is fired up. Man, he's been chomping at the bit for 45 years. He wants it. Let me add him. And he goes after him. Okay, and then in verse 13, it says, Joshua blessed him. Okay, now, Joshua is the Old Testament word for Jesus in the New Testament. Okay, so if you take that as spiritual application, when you believe all that God says, Jesus Christ will bless you, because you're a blessing to him. Okay? It's a blessing to our God to believe what he says. Now, man 
that are believers that doesn't want to accept all of the Bible, they're going to put a brand on that where Paul said in Acts 24, 14, the way which they call heresy, so I believe all that the prophets have spoken. They will say, okay, he's a heretic, he's a cultist, or whatnot. Okay, but that's not a return we want to throw back. Why? Because they're brethren, they're saved. We can be a blessing to them. Okay, but then he says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. This is the entire chapter is about deception. And boy, do we live in an age of deception. In fact, in this age, it is easier to deceive people than to convince them they have been deceived. It's a lot easier. Truth is stranger than fiction. And if that doesn't apply to this age, I don't know when it does. Truth is stranger than fiction. Okay, in 1 Timothy 4, the entire chapter is about deception, seducing spirit, doctrines of devils. So how can we overcome this deception? Paul said in verse 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Believe the doctrines. Continuing then, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You see, God is worthy. God Almighty is worthy for you and I to believe all of his words, including the doctrines and the unusual truth. He's worthy of that. Who am I? Who am I to pick and choose what I want to believe? When I read through this book, who am I? I say, well, I agree with it. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. I've set myself equal with God. Believers who pick and choose parts of the Bible they want to believe, unfortunately, they're going to face a disinheritance. They're not going to lose their salvation. That's secure in Christ. But they will forfeit an inheritance, some type of an inheritance. The more you and I sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you honor him. The sacrifice of time and money honors the Lord. Not only that, the sacrifice of your reputation. Other believers will mar your reputation and sometimes affect your relationships with other believers And if you accept that as part of believing what God says, you are honoring the Lord. You're being a blessing to the Lord. Why? Because He's worthy. He is worthy for us to believe Him. Now, Paul put it this way very simply. Acts 27, 25. Love the passage. Of course, all the pastors are good. But uh, here he is on a ship. Bad storm. Euroclidon type of a hurricane, typhoon, on the Mediterranean Sea. The ship's going down. They've thrown everything out. Everybody thinks they're going to die. The plane's going down. We're good. We're good as dead. And an angel showed up to him and told him, okay, here's what the Lord said. You're gonna, the ship's going to be destroyed. 276 of your uh, passengers on the boat's going to survive. They're going to get up on shore. Okay? And Paul got these guys in front of him, and all he said, the circumstances didn't look like right. The circumstances did not match the promise. And Paul just said, I believe the Lord. I believe God even as it was told me. That's all he said. And I'm sure 275 guys thought, he is a nut. Get a straitjacket. But when they got to the shore, they found out the nut was screwed to the right bolt. He was right. And simply, Caleb is a true Bible believer. He's a Bible believer. He tried to get them to believe the ideas and promise of God, but they chose not. He just said, oh, they're brethren. They're brethren. But we just keep going forward and believe God. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord by believing what He says. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask You to help us to be... People that when we read the Bible, we scratch our heads on many of the things that's written that we'll just say, I I may not understand. I believe it, though. I believe it. It's like there's a saying, you know, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. 
Well, technically, I don't have to believe it. It's settled anyway. But for my benefit, I believe it. Lord, help us to be people who believe your words, follow the instructions, and help us try to be a blessing to the ones that follow the instructions. may not believe the doctrines or some of the words, but try to be a blessing to them. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to honor you by our sacrifices for you. Because you are most definitely worthy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll be dismissed with that.